Uh, so thank you very much, and thank all of you for being here, and thanks to the CLA Assembly for hosting us. This is the traditional first meeting of the Assembly every year. And the state of the college is a time to acknowledge some of our successes, our challenges, and our opportunities as a college. It's our chance to discuss some of our aims for the year ahead and to take a look at where we've been over the past year. And any way you look at it, 2018, 2019 was a year that really raised the bar for the college. It was the college's best ever fundraising year. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In honor of our 150th anniversary, Governor Dayton announced CLA Day in the state of Minnesota, as did Mayor Fry in Minneapolis. We even had the I-35W bridge lit maroon and gold in our honor for our 150th anniversary. And I will say, unprompted, President Kehler wore his CLA cap in the homecoming parade. So <laughs> yet another victory. Uh, it was a truly special year of reflection, remembering, and looking forward. Now, the 150th also meant a lot of extra work for a lot of people, many of whom are in this room. And I want to thank all of you for making it such a successful celebration. For the year ahead, we will want to build on last year's momentum and uh, to advance a number of initiatives that I'll outline today. First, let me discuss our Civic Readiness Initiative. For the past five years, we have been deeply engaged in CLA on our Career Readiness Initiative. In addition to expanded career services and employer relations led by our, by our terrific career services team, we've set the standard for thoughtful ways to integrate career readiness into the lives of our students from day one. Our departments have been involved in career readiness, and we have engaged our alumni in numerous ways in this work, including the outstanding series of videos, We Are Liberal Arts. Our work, which emphasizes student acquisition of 10 core career competencies, has students engaging in the reflect, articulate, translate, and evaluate process to map their liberal arts experiences in and out of the classroom, and involves faculty through the Faculty Fellows Program and in other ways as well. All of that has generated great interest around the country. I want to thank Associate Dean Oskin Kerner, Professor and Career Readiness Faculty Director Amy Lee, and Career Readiness Director Judy Anderson for their leadership in this work. Those of us in CLA always knew that a liberal arts education prepares students well for successful and meaningful careers. So we were working from a strong foundation. But we also knew there was a negative narrative about the liberal arts and career opportunities that we needed to respond to. We wanted to advocate and not apologize for the liberal arts, and we wanted to be on offense and not on defense. Our career readiness initiative did exactly that. It has enabled students and employers to see the connections between liberal arts education and great career outcomes more clearly. Rather than deficit thinking, our initiative has been premised on and helped students recognize the many strengths they bring to the table, what we call their liberal arts advantage. In the same way, we in the liberal arts have always believed we prepare students for lives of civic and community engagement. But here too, like with career readiness, we can take steps to help students build their skills and see the connections between their education and the next stage of their lives as civic participants. And here too, we know there are challenges. I don't need to tell you that we live in an increasingly polarized political time. And while that polarization has led to some well-publicized situations on campuses across the country, in which speakers were shouted down or events were canceled, those situations are actually relatively few, albeit quite dramatic and often quite concerning. More challenging on a daily basis is how to help our students learn to engage in conversation and discussion across these lines of difference, whatever those differences might be. A 2017 survey of more than 3,000 college students conducted by Gallup and the Knight Foundation found that three-fifths of student respondents said the climate on their campus stifled speech. They reported feeling that students blocked out views they disagreed with. And that's not just a national occurrence. Here at the University of Minnesota, 
Our student experience in the Research University Survey, or CIRU, shows very similar results, which I've written about previously on my blog. At a fundamental level, the liberal arts are about questioning the boundaries of our knowledge and understanding. We're at our best when we employ a broad intellectual toolbox and a humility that recognizes that insights may be found across the political spectrum, across our disciplines, and across our many communities. Liberal arts disciplines excel at seeing the world through the eyes of others. In that sense, empathy is a skill and an approach that is repeatedly provided to our students. A liberal arts culture is one that understands that if you expect to be heard, you must also be able to listen. Now, to be clear, this is not about timid and restrictive civility. I don't use that word in talking about this initiative. But it's about the ability to engage in robust and perhaps passionate dialogue, discussion, disagreement, and debate. For those reasons, we will be launching the Civic Readiness Initiative, our effort to prepare our students to engage confidently in civic life and to demonstrate that they can do so just as our Career Readiness Initiative prepares our students to launch confidently into the world of careers. And like our, like our Career Readiness Initiative, our Civic Readiness Initiative will build off what we do so well in the liberal arts while adding new experiences and opportunities for our students as well. Over the past six to nine months, we've had informal conversations with small groups of department chairs, faculty, and staff about what such an initiative might entail. I want to thank sociology chair Doug Hartman, who has been doing a great job in initiating and convening these conversations. My hope is that civic readiness will provide a framework for preparing students for meaningful, productive lives as citizens and engaged community members. As with career readiness, we'll be able to leverage our curriculum and some existing infrastructure to create an initiative that will be greater than the sum of its parts. Some of the efforts we will consider pursuing within the Civic Readiness Initiative are the following. For example, a skills-based program to develop students' capacity for expressing and exchanging ideas and engaging in difficult discussion. Media and social media literacy in their connection to civic discussion. Applied learning opportunities like internships, research, and community engagement activities for students to practice their civic engagement skills and to gain new experiences. Seed money for curricular development, professional development, and research grants for faculty and staff around this initiative. A new certificate program that provides a cohesive structure for coursework and applied learning opportunities and signals to prospective employers that an individual, a student from CLA, has the skills to manage challenging situations and hard conversations in the workplace. And dynamic public programming, including visiting professors or public intellectuals to engage our community and model dialogue, discussion, debate, and disagreement. Through the Civic Ready Readiness Initiative, we aim to help our students be better prepared to leverage the values and skills of a liberal arts education for civic engagement and public discourse. It is certainly not something they are seeing modeled in social media or, frankly, in much of our politics at this point in time. So the job is really ours to do in the liberal arts, and we think Minnesota is absolutely the right place to do it. With its long-standing history of civic engagement, appreciation for social diversity, and commitment to public institutions, we believe that Minnesota, both as a state and as a land-grant university, is well positioned to play a, neat, a leading national role with this initiative, just as, as we have done for career readiness. A second area of our focused attention this year is addressing the achievement or opportunity gap. Nearly a third of CLA students are the first in their families to attend college. About a fifth are Pell Grant eligible. Around 40% of our population is made up of transfer students who are on the whole more ethnically and racially diverse, more low to lower middle income, and more first generation than students who join us directly from high school. Now college is supposed to be rigorous, challenging, and even unsettling. There will be setbacks that you have to overcome, 
That is part of a college education. We expect that all of our students will have those experiences in one way or another. And in some respects, we actually want them to have those experiences and learn from them. However, the students that I mentioned earlier may face additional challenges to succeeding on a college campus. For example, those who come from lower socioeconomic or underrepresented backgrounds can be caught off guard by colleges' hidden expenses or unfamiliar cultural mores, or be stymied by university jargon. They're actually not the only ones stymied by university <laughs> jargon, but particularly stymied by university jargon. Some may question their sense of belonging on this campus. Significant family and work responsibilities need to be balanced with their academics. Some live at home to save money, thereby missing out on aspects of college life that help students build community and establish support networks on campus. In order to work and meet family obligations, some attend college part-time, lengthening the time to degree and putting further into the future the return on investment of a college education. What all of these students have in common is this. They worked hard, they earned their way here to the U, they belong here, and we have an obligation to help them thrive. Our Office of Undergraduate Education has done excellent work around achievement or opportunity gap issues. We are very, very fortunate in CLA to have nationally prominent leaders like Alex Hines, the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Access in the Office of Undergraduate Education, who energizes our thinking in this space and who frankly needs a new award shelf because his has got to be full at this point. Uh, this past year, we requested and received $185,000 in recurring funds through the compact process for additional advising support and the implementation and expansion of programming, touch points, and bridging initiatives for students of color in CLA. For the most part, thinking and awareness about the achievement or opportunity gap has been a matter of attention within the CLA Office of Undergraduate Education. Some of us, maybe many of us in this room, are probably more aware of the macro level nationally than we are aware of the situation within our own college, and that needs to change. This year, I want us to focus on making the achievement or opportunity gap an issue that is owned across the college by all of us. This is an issue for all of us to work on. A first step will be for all of us to develop a greater awareness of the patterns in our college. For example, did you know that the four-year graduation rate for white students in CLA is 69%, and for American Indian and students of color, it is 60%, a gap of nine points? Or that the four-year graduation rate for first-generation students is seven points lower than for other students, and that the four-year rate is nine points lower for Pell-eligible students than it is for other students? Or if you are neither first-generation nor Pell eligible, your four-year graduation rate is 70%. However, if you are both first-gen and Pell eligible, your four-year graduation rate is 58%, a 12-point gap. Add race and ethnicity into that mix, and the gap spreads to 15 points in the four-year graduation rate. Now, my guess is that most of us don't know about these patterns, so that's why increased awareness will need to be a first step in our collective ownership of these issues. When we drill down further to the level of the department or the individual course, we similarly aren't likely to have great awareness about the patterns within our department or even within our own courses that we teach as faculty. So we need to address that as well. And I'll say I'm influenced by my own experience here. When I was teaching a large introductory course with hundreds of students, usually somewhere in the 300 to 500 range, I could receive a report that would show me but the proportion of students getting a D, F, or who withdrew from the course. And that data would be broken down by race, gender, Pell eligible, and so on. What that gave me the opportunity to do was to look at my class and ask, why am I seeing these patterns? Why is, the achieve, why is the achievement rate so much better for one group than the other? 
Am I doing something in my course that might be inadvertently contributing to these patterns? I believe some data sharing of this sort would be very helpful here in CLA, not to place judgment or blame, but as a powerful tool for an individual instructor and for departments overall. All it's saying is, here's some information you've never had. This is how things are breaking down in your course or in your department. Now, knowing this, would you make any changes, whether in assignments, exams, the reading list, the discussion sections, pedagogical methods, or something else? This is not to say that our only interest is in classroom outcomes. We would want to, act, uh, we would want to examine as well access to internships, research with faculty, service learning, learning abroad, and other experiential opportunities to understand how these factor into student outcomes, such as retention and graduation rates, but also how they factor into successfully launching into careers and civic life. I will be appointing a small group to begin considering, to begin considering some of these matters that I've just discussed around the achievement and opportunity gap and how we can elevate this to a concern we own collectively as a college and will work on collectively as a college, led by the great work that's being done in our Office of Undergraduate Education. If this is a project that you would like to be involved in in some way, or if you have some ideas or suggestions for things we might consider, please do send me a note. The last initiative I'd like to discuss today is creating an ever stronger culture of teaching in CLA. Teaching obviously plays a large role in defining the experiences of our almost 14,000 undergraduate and 1,600 graduate students. While striving for research excellence is understandably first of mind for us as scholars, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, and the relentless pursuit of research and creative excellence is indeed a core pillar of the CLA roadmap that defines much of our success, it's as teachers that we ultimately have the most direct impact on our students. Our students benefit from being taught by the world's leading researchers. As a student, and I tell parents this all the time when uh, I am visiting with them, as a student it matters that you're taking your courses with the people who are writing the articles and writing the books and creating the art, not just assigning the articles, the books, and the art. It matters that you may have an opportunity to engage in research and creative work with these amazing scholars. So we truly offer our students something special in that regard in CLA. Just as we seek to, uh, just as we seek to excel in our research and our creative pursuits, we also seek to excel in our teaching. High quality teaching improves the lives of our students, which certainly is a motivation for all of us as faculty and instructors. And high quality teaching also furthers the reach and impact of our scholarship in our discipline we want to look at it from uh, a self-interest point of view, and that too should motivate us all. The better the experience students have had in our classes, and the better able they are to articulate and share what they've learned, the farther the impact of your research and teaching can spread. One of the ways that we've sought to strengthen the culture of teaching in CLA over the past few years is through the Career Readiness Teaching Fellows Program. The program was designed to help faculty better support students in understanding and articulating their liberal arts advantage. But it has also served as an important catalyst for interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary conversations around teaching as an activity worth of intellectual inquiry. It has helped clarify our values as teachers in the college and what outcomes we hope to achieve through the courses that we teach. We've had 23 departments, nearly 70 faculty and PA instructors, and about 20 graduate student instructors participate in the Teaching Fellows Program. That is impressive. Fellows have initiated conversations about teaching in their departments, asking their colleagues to share their pedagogical approaches and what does and does not work in their classrooms. To celebrate our commitment to teaching, this year we will hold an inaugural CLA-wide Day of Teaching and Learning in early May. The goal is for us to come together as a community to share our insights and to learn from one another across disciplines. This year's focus will be on engaging diversity and promoting inclusion and accessibility across our curriculum. 
The day will start off with a keynote by Dr. Susan Ambrose, author of How Learning Works, and Senior Vice Chancellor for Educational Innovation and Professor of Education and History at Northeastern University. The day of teaching and learning will also include panels, discussions, workshops, and much more. It's being planned by a committee of faculty and instructors and facilitated by the Office of Undergraduate Education. CLA's day of teaching and learning is a public statement of the importance of teaching in our college. It's an acknowledgement that what happens in the classroom is essential to how our students experience the values and advantages of a liberal arts education. And it recognizes that the better the experience our students have, the more the key questions and concerns of liberal arts research and creative work moves beyond the campus and into our communities and places of employment. There will be other opportunities as well this year to gather as a teaching community. And I encourage certainly all departments, faculty, instructors, and graduate students to be involved. And I also want to encourage those of you who are not instructors as well to be involved in this and to go to the panels, go to the workshops, and learn and to participate in, in hearing more about what we're doing and what makes for great teaching and a great experience for our students. In addition to these new areas of focus, we will continue to work on projects and initiatives that are ongoing in the college, to name just a few among the many. We have begun working with our P&A board about ways we might enhance the professional support and opportunities for our P&A instructors, building off of the multi-year contracts and the first time CLA assembly representation that we have added in, in recent years as well as our discussions with departments in three-year planning uh, about instructional staff issues within the unit. My hope is that we will identify three to five steps that we can take to establish these positions more clearly as a fulfilling professional and career track with improved opportunities for leadership and engagement in department governance. Our three-year planning became an even more collaborative process last year when we started our second uh, wave of three-year planning, and we will continue that improved process this year with much more upfront collaboration from college offices with the departments that are doing the planning. In support of faculty research, we are the first college at the university moving forward with fully funded one semester sabbaticals. I've been saying for five years this is just around the corner, and lo and behold, we can see the corner. How do you like that? Uh, here it is. Um, and I thank Associate Dean Jane Blocker for her great leadership on this issue. We've continued to enhance and better promote the research services provided to faculty, staff, and graduate students by our Office of Research and Graduate Programs and the research group in Lattice. And finally, in last year's State of the College Address, I discussed thinking of parts of our curriculum in a different way in, ter in terms of hubs and spokes rather than what I call the traditional Model T interpretation of the liberal arts. This year, I will, be, I will be asking a curriculum innovation strategy team to pick up on that discussion and bring people together to think about ways we might, to think about what we might do with regard to moving forward on things like modular courses, our summer curriculum, implementing our digital and online strategy, and considering possible areas of opportunity for certificates, or interdisciplinary minors, and we could add more to that mix as well. Now, of course, advancing on these new initiatives that I mentioned, as well as the continuing priorities that I just discussed, is dependent on resources. So I'd like to give you a quick overview of where we finished the fiscal year and what we're looking at in the year to come. As I discussed in my August monthly memo sent to all faculty and staff, while in recent years CLA has balanced its budget, the recently completed, completed fiscal year 2019 required us to draw more on our carry forward and reserve funds to balance the budget than we would prefer to do. Although we have been prepared to do that in order to invest in strategic priorities in hiring and in other areas, carry forward funds are a well that we can't draw water on too frequently or too extensively before it goes dry. I'm feeling very folksy saying that, like I should be in Iowa or New Hampshire at this, at, at this point. 
As I mentioned in my monthly memo, various factors were at play last year. Most notably, final tuition revenue did not see the surpluses of previous years. With tuition providing about three quarters of our revenue, we are highly tuition dependent in CLA. In fact, having looked around a little bit at some of these stats, we are actually more tuition dependent than most of the private liberal arts colleges in the state of Minnesota are tuition dependent. They obviously rely much more on philanthropy uh, than we do. Thus, it is absolutely critical that we are focusing our instructional resources in areas of greater student interest and demand. Doing so will be absolutely critical as we move into our new sabbatical system. We simply don't have the budget to be spending resources on, on courses that are not attracting students. Our summer revenue also continued to drop, and this has been a, a decade-long, more than decade-long trend. Some, though too few, of our departments did improve their, their summer numbers and benefited from our summer tuition sharing initiative. As a college, we need, we are reliant upon a strong summer surplus in order to balance our fall and spring spending. Put differently, we run a deficit in the fall and the spring that needs to be balanced by a surplus in the summer. So summer is not a luxury for us, but rather is essential to the financial well-being of the college, and we have to do better in, in summer enrollments. During the fall and across the, the rest of the academic year, you'll be hearing, hearing more from me on these uh, fiscal topics as we will need to identify way, ways we can operate more efficiently and effectively and to ensure our revenues and budgeted expenses are aligned. That will mean looking at both the spending and the revenue side of the equation. And doing this will be critical to moving forward on the initiatives I mentioned earlier, to ongoing issues like the implementation of fully funded sabbaticals, and on our recurring and persistent goals, such as improved graduate student funding and improved faculty and staff compensation. Now, while we certainly have to take those financial concerns seriously, we do not have to fear them because, as they say, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. And as a college, we have accomplished remarkable things in recent years. I said at the beginning that 2018-2019 was a terrific year. So let me come full circle and share with you some specifics of what you accomplished during that year. First, we are deepening our engagement with community partners. In addition to introducing our new Civitas Awards for community partners, our effort to establish the Liberal Arts, Liberal Arts Engagement Hub called for in the CLA roadmap has been successful. The hub will occupy a prominent space in the newly re renovated Pillsbury Hall, and during construction, a hub pilot has been organized in Nolte Center. This academic year, the hub will sponsor five exciting projects with community partners. Second, we are improving support for our graduate students. We increased funding for graduate students, including greater support for writing fellowships and summer fellowships, along with giving our programs greater flexibility and control over many kinds of graduate student support. And we've added staffing to provide more timely student services, including in-person counseling and a growing array of programming designed to help graduate students move into a broad range of careers. And I thank Associate Dean Steve Manson for his hard work and leadership on those reforms. Third, we continued to support interdisciplinary inquiry with new interdisciplinary collaborative workshops focused on democracy under threat, the Black Midwest Initiative, the many faces of reproducibility, bodies that haunt, and collaborative writing in teaching, learning, and scholarship. Fourth, we are hearing the voice of our staff and providing professional development opportunities. The CLA Indigenous Staff and Staff of Color community has been doing great work and has ambitious plans for its second year. Back in the spring, the, the, the group uh, conducted a survey of our staff of color in order to get a more fine-grained sense of what's working and what is not working in CLA. And I just recently received 
that report and look forward to discussing the results. Our administrative leadership program continues to go strong with three cohorts having successfully competed, com completed the program and a fourth round coming up this year. Fifth, once again, we enrolled more new students than our admissions target uh, called for. Our graduation and retention rates are at all time highs, as is the diversity of our students. That is a team effort involving many of you in college offices and in our departments. Sixth, staff in Lattice and the Office of Faculty and Academic Affairs improved our administrative processes by successfully piloting the dossier building builder tool, which is a major innovation and step forward for preparing and submitting pro promotion and tenure materials. That reform is part of our broader effort to ensure that we are providing high quality, world-class responsive services throughout the college. Over the coming, uh, coming year and coming years, you will be receiving surveys from our various offices so that our teams can highlight what we're doing well, what we need to continue, and areas where we need to improve. And many of you would have received one from our human resources team uh, last year. So more to come on that. And lastly, as I noted at the start of my remarks, we had the best fundraising year in CLA history, raising over $31 million, which is nearly $10 million over our previous high. Overall, we are at 93% of our campaign goal of $150 million, having raised $139 million to date with about two years to go in our campaign. So we will easily move past that $150 million measure. Now that doesn't just happen. That happens because you, all of you, and your uh, colleagues who are not here, have made this a college that people want to support and a college that people want to invest in. This work shows that we are capable of extraordinary things when we work together, and it is work to be extremely proud of. What I've discussed today, the achievements of the last year, the areas we'll focus on in the year to come. All of this comes down to the hard work of many individuals and many groups. It is your mentoring and instruction, your scholarship and creative work, and your service and leadership that keep this list of accomplishments growing. From taking an extra moment with a student who is struggling, to putting the finishing touches on your latest publication, to helping a colleague it's the small and very big things that you do that make this college what it is and as successful as it is. You create excellence and opportunity. You help transform the lives of students who then go out and transform the industries they join, the organizations they run, and the communities they live in. Every single one of you, regardless of what office you're in, what your position is in, it, what your position is, every single one of you is involved in that work. And you've, as you've heard me say, we seek in the CLA roadmap to be a destination college, not to pat ourselves on the back, but because the stronger our research and creative work, the better prepared our students for careers and civic life, the more inclusive and respective our college culture, and the deeper our community partnerships, the more good we can do here on campus and far beyond. So I want to thank all of you for what you do to make this an extraordinary place to work and to learn. And I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. I look forward to continuing our work together over the coming year, and I wish all of you a great year. Thank you.